Um, but with no further ado, I've got uh, the great pleasure of being able to welcome to the stage uh, Rowena Duncan, who's going to facilitate the sponsorship partnership session uh, on the future of farming um, for the future customer. Uh, Rowena, you probably know Rowena, uh, she's a big advocate of agriculture, well known across the red meat sector, uh, th particularly through her involvement with the country radio station. And uh, we're very grateful to Rowena for stepping in. Uh, Kerry was unwell and so Rowena's uh, stepped in the last minute, so a big thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I hate to think what your efficiency cameras would look like when I've been hunting and I'm trying to cut up a, a deer carcass. Very slow and painful process, that one. Uh, look, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here today, uh, as Kim mentioned, stepping in for Kerry Woodham, who uh, was rendered lame at the last minute yesterday. I was en route to the airport and got the call up. Um, I can't dance. I'm never going to be found on Dancing with the Stars. I'm not a star either. Can't run a marathon. Uh, and I'm an ex-dairy farmer at a Red Meat Sector Conference, so that's always a bit interesting uh, too. So thanks very much to Beef and Lamb for sponsoring this panel. Uh, I did also facilitate a panel for them two years ago at the uh, conference in Rotorua. Uh, it was the Young Farmers panel. So uh, I've graduated to the adults uh, today. Look, uh, there's an old adage in media if it bleeds, it leads. So, uh, and these are now Kerry's words from this point on, uh, therefore too often we hear about the sad, the mad and the bad farmers. Uh, so today we're going to hear representatives from the farming community who love what they do. They're proud of what they do and they believe in the future of what they do. So we're going to start from the south to the north. Uh, so if you can tell us who you are, where you farm and what you farm. And we'll start with you, James. Thanks, thanks, Ro. Uh, I love what I do. I don't know if I love this, but... Um, so, yeah, I, I farm in Heartlands, uh, Central Southland. Um, we're about at 10,000 stock unit you know, sheep and beef farm and 1,000 uh, cow dairy farm. Uh, we call it rolling. North Islanders would call it dead flat. Um, and yeah, really reliable Heartland, Southland. Um, I would say at the moment, uh, being a sheep and beef farmer is a bit like being a Southland stag supporter. You've just got to keep the faith. I was literally just thinking about the stags as you said that, and I was going to say, is it our year? Uh, I also support the Southland stags because they need all the support they can get. Otherwise, they're going to end up in the Heartland Championship with my beloved Wanganui. Uh, right, we'll move a bit further north to the North Island. Mark. You guys sound like Warrior supporters too, don't you? <laughs> Keep your faith. Um, uh, yeah, morning all. My name's Mark Guscott. Uh, I farm about an hour here um, at a little place called Martinborough um, with my wife Susanna and we've got three teenage kids. Um, I would say it's the centre of the universe, but I know probably you guys will argue the point. Um, so we're a mix of sheep, beef, cropping, and we do a bit of tourism as well. Uh, so we've developed a sort of reasonably diverse sort of business in the last 20 years or so. so uh, yeah, it keeps me off the street, so yeah, quite, quite excited to be here though. Yeah, I'm from Whanganui and I call that the centre of the universe. I've been doing it for about two decades, so I need to patent that claim. Now we've got Alan and Joe. Now, Alan won the Paper Scissors Rock, so he is going to answer this first question. Thanks, Ro. Um, yep, we're Alan and Joe Johnstone. We um, farm at Pukituru, just south of Tikiwiri in the King Country. Um, we're uh, beef and lamb producers, um, proud, proud uh, shareholders of Silverfern Farms. Um, we've got a team of four staff and um, we also support two growing future farmers students that Joe's quite involved with. Um, yeah, that's us. Right. Fantastic. Uh, so as we mentioned earlier, you guys obviously have to love what you do, um, you know, otherwise you wouldn't put yourself through the ordeal of being up here on stage uh, with me, you know, on an industry panel. So we're going to look at why are you so passionate about what you do, and I think we've got a photo there uh, that our farmers have sent through just to demonstrate their why. Uh, James. Jason. Jace, sorry, why am I calling you James? Um, I couldn't find a decent photo of the farm, so I put the family up. But actually, why 
why I put that photo up is we're an intergenerational farming family and that really drives a lot of our behaviour and how we think about the business, the industry. Um, you know, we take a long-term view in everything um, and that leads into the stuff we do around sustainability, environment, animal welfare. Um, you know, we have a saying in our business, the standard you set is what you're prepared to walk past. So, yeah, it's really, really important to us. Fantastic. Um, Mark, we're going to head over to your photo next, uh, and I'm extremely jealous of this, having just moved to Auckland and being nowhere near, being able to go hunting. Yeah, it's, it's, we're quite similar actually to Jason's. Like, that's a photo of my daughter Annabelle, so she's 16 and she's married on hunting, but like you, Ro. And so there was a, a to uh, photo taken a couple of months ago, and um, she's a cl classic teenager in that. And she just sort of slopes along, not really that interested in much. But if she's got a better shot at something up the hill, she'll just run up that hill real quick. So I was just sort of, um, just sort of spoke to me. It's a nice view, you know. That's what you know, kind of area that we farm in, pretty dry there at that time. Um, but if you'd have asked me um, to, to your question, if you'd have asked me as a teenager if I wanted to be a farmer, I probably would have said no, nah, not interested. Um, I was a child of the 80s, and it was pretty difficult. Um, but like Jason, we're a multi-generational. Um, right back, like in a Pākehā measurement, like on, on the, in the Pākehā measurement, it's a sixth generation, but um, we've got Māori ancestry as well, who are on the farm, they didn't farm it, they hunted and gathered, so, you know, we, we sort of, th I think about it in a, in a 500 year view, um, so it is really difficult to, um, you know, separate your day-to-day -day decisions from that sort of thinking, but it has to be done, because that's the way I view it and, and feel about it, um, and I really love it, I love the challenge of it every day. It's cool. That's probably a very good thing, uh, especially yeah, yeah. at the moment. Uh, Joe, let's head on to your photo. Uh, what is it that you, why do you love farming and what does this photo mean to you? Uh, thanks, Ro. Um, yeah, so we, uh, as I'll explain before, we're Wallace Johnstone Limited. We're an agribusiness. We're involved in um, uh, obviously sheep and beef, but also dairy and forestry, and um, we have an ag contracting business as well. So um, I guess that we chose that photo because that's our home base, that's where we're, um, we're based, and our ethos is really to continue generations of excellence. So um, the reason we chose that statement is because it recognises where, where we've come from, it recognises where we are at the moment, and also about planning for the future. So we absolutely love what we do. We consider ourselves very lucky to do what we do. Uh, we are a fourth, gener a fourth generational farm, um, and so we have our children, Lily and Harry, who are in their early 20s, um, looking to take the baton on. And we are always planning for the next 100 years and beyond. So um, I think probably something that's important to us is Alan and I operate as a team. Um, we both have different strengths, um, which is good because it covers off the other's weaknesses. Um, and we're passionate about our product, about being profitable, about our environment, and most importantly to me, about people. So we build strong relationships. Um, we, we value loyalty and collaboration, and uh, we have a strong relationship with our um, supplier, Silverfern, uh, we supply Silverfern Farms because um, we feel that, that they um, share the same vision that we have. Um, so most importantly to us, I guess, is our family, um, our farm team, our community, um, and then other industry um, that we're involved with, in, like our banks, our, our processes, and but most importantly, our consumer. They have to appreciate what the product is, is that we're putting out there. So. Um, we're very focused on, on a product of delicious, healthy, high quality food and, um, and we think it's really important that we walk the walk. So it's all very well saying these things but we have to make sure that we follow those up. So um, for example, we've planted 35,000 native trees in the last five years and, um, and that's been something that we're very proud of. 
I loved uh, Alan's smile there when you mentioned that, you know, you complement each other's weaknesses. And it's like, weaknesses? I don't have any weaknesses. <laughs> uh, that was a bit like Jamie Mackay and I. He knew the sheep and beef, I knew the dairy. So everything uh, I know, if I pull out any knowledge today, it's all come from him and we can blame him for that. Look, so much of the, the conversation already today has, has really centred around, um, you know, what we're doing. <coughs> Companies and farmers are being really proactive out there. It's all about getting out in front. Now, you're all involved in really different programs uh, in terms of chasing excellence, I guess you could say, on farm. Um, Mark, you're part of the Atkins Ranch Regenerative Farming Program. Now, uh, I was watching Jeremy Clarkson's Clarkson's Farm over the weekend, where he was learning all about regenerative farming with Andy Cato from Groove Armada. Um, what is, you know, the Atkins Ranch Regenerative Program, what does that mean to you and your soil and, you know, your business? Yeah, well, at Atkins Ranch, we sort of went out into the... Um you know, uh, I suppose the regen space maybe four or five years ago, probably, um, and it's a, it's a reaction to a to the, to, the, to a market. You know, we, we believe that, and I think the, the country believes that there's um, um, there's a, a market segment out there that wants to um, do right by the planet, and we think the way we farm, and I'm sure these other guys are the same. We all we're kind of doing that stuff already. So it's how do you monetize that? And I think um, Hamish Mara and well, I was talking about that before, how do you monetize this sort of stuff? It's actually really difficult. And so first step is really um, get the farm processes going, understand what it all means. Um, and to me, regenerative agriculture is just about, um, it's an evolution. It's just new, introducing new ideas into what's already a pretty dynamic sort of industry. Um, um, it doesn't have a, a, you know, a, what's the word, a definition. And I think that's actually a really good thing because then you can kind of carry on almost doing what we're doing now um, and then with some different tweaks, um, and it's outcomes based. Well, the way the way we measure it is outcome based. So we have um, an independent auditor that comes once a year to every farm, and they get down on their hands and knees and they count the critters and the dig holes and all that sort of stuff. So, it, uh, um, and it, some some of the stuff's quite challenging, but um, but it actually it just feels right. Like the first time we did it was like shit. This is a bit weird. But as we've gone on the, along the process, um, it's been really rewarding. Um, We've done different things, some have worked, some haven't, um, but, and, and we've actually get, managed to gather the odd market premium from time to time, so that's sort of gloss on, the, on, on it all, really. Yeah. Now I know from uh, having emceed the Primary Industries Summit here at Tarkina a couple of weeks ago, a lot of questions coming from the floor were, are there genuinely market premiums out there? And do you feel that you're getting the return on that? Um, to, to some extent, yes. There's the odd, the odd co-product that um, has had that. Um, the, that's not to say that the world economic stuff at the moment ain't great. So some of those market premiums have been there, and then now they're not there because of, um, you know, there's um, inventory and supply chains, that sort of stuff. So, um, but I know that I know the Atkins Ranch team behind the scenes are working pretty hard at, at getting more of that sort of stuff. I mean, the whole reason Atkins Ranch exists is to get f premiums. Or get as much value back to the farm gate as possible. Um, it's always been like that ever since it started in 1989. So that that stuff's just it's normal it's normal business really. To be fair, to try and get all that sort of stuff back. James, you're part of the New Zealand Farm Assurance Program Plus, FAP Plus. We heard about that at the drinks uh, last night, the welcome drinks. What do you find as being part of this program? Um, I get. I guess what it it's given us a level of surety that we're achieving um, uh, auditable uh, outcomes that give us confidence and basically allow us to sleep at night and know that our farming system is um, fully sustainable. Um, so before we joined that program, we probably 15 years ago started moving in that direction. So we looked at where the world was going, and I'm talking outside of New Zealand, and we started moving in that direction. So one of the challenges on our property is it's 10 kilometres of waterways. Um, so that's taken 30 kilometres of riparian fencing to deal with that, and that's to a sheep standard, so expensive. But I look at it um, that time is always the enemy of change. If you give yourself enough runway, we can generally adapt and change. What we don't want to do in our business is put ourselves in a risk position where you know, we have to change 
in a very short space of time because we financially can't afford to. So we'd already started that process, but we didn't, we didn't have an audit standard that when people come onto our place or where customers come in and question us, we have got data that can back up our farming system. And through that program, that's allowed us to have that. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, unless there's a premium, I'm not interested in going there. Well, my response to that is you need, you need this sort of level of confidence, A, just to get the ticket to the game, but also for your own benefit, because at the end of the day, if your farm isn't sustainable, there's something you're doing that is, is um, you know, over the long term having a negative impact. Wouldn't you want to change that? Uh, just a quick question there. How many kilometres, again, of uh, riparian fencing did you do? I've done 30 kilometres. And, and, uh, and the interesting thing is, so, yeah, large cost, but there's also been production gains. So um, a lot of our creeks in the summer dry out and become stock hazards, which, you know, obviously no longer the case now. It's also allowed us to, the reason it's not 20 kilometres is we've gone a lot wider and created wetlands that have, you know, now we measure our water quality three times a year. So if anyone comes onto our property and say, well, you're having a negative impact, we've got the data that says, well, actually, no, we're not. The water entering our property is of a lower quality than what's exiting. That was a much better answer. I was just trying to get you to roll your R's and say 30 again. So <laughs> <laughs> I missed that from being down south. What advice would you give, James, to, to people who are maybe considering... FAP Plus and signing up, what would you say to them? Look, I, I mean, I, I think um, there's, there's a significant amount of work to get to the level, but um, we now have data capture systems that take a lot of the work out of it, and then once you're in the system, um, you know, I, I don't actually find it such a big impost, and actually, as you're harvesting that data, there's all sorts of production opportunities to use that data in a different way. So. You know, I think it's a positive thing. Fantastic. Um, Al and Joe, I know you're part of Silver Fern Farms' Net Carbon Zero Beef Program. What do you get out of the program, Al? Yeah, so we've um, gone along with that journey with Silver Fern Farms. Um, I think they term it a carbon inset as opposed to a carbon offset. So um, we have got areas of our farm that have been mapped for, um, for their program and they, they inset that against their product and market. So we supply be, um, beef through the beef EQ system. You have to be NZ Fat Plus. Um, you you talk, to, talk about the digital technology, you've got to be EASDs. You've got to comply with all these levels and, and um, to get into that program. So it's, it's been good. It's been good for us, you know, and um, we've we've been given the opportunity to go and market with Silver Fern Farms, which um, just just seeing the product on shelves in market. So uh, in 2016, I went to China with them, and then also had an op uh, went again to the States, uh, Korea, and Japan over the last couple of years. So it's been really good. What else have you found out? being in market, you know, what really struck you? Um, what really struck me is the shelves are really busy. And you know, you talk about regen and all that sort of stuff. It's just, there's so much on the shelves. So I, I can see it's so hard to get your product on shelf and appeal to the consumer. Uh, Mark, you've also been to the US uh, and the markets there. What did you find out in the big wide world? Yeah, look, it's really fascinating stuff. And I actually think it it should be almost a compulsory thing for, for farmers to, um, to do a, a market trip sometime in their career, preferably early on. Whether they pay their own way or not, I don't, I don't know, but it's, it's really fascinating. You, I mean, you go around different categories of supermarkets and how different supermarkets of the same brand set up within different stores. It's a really fair, I've actually become a bit of a supermarket nerd, to be fair. Like, I really find it fascinating how they, um, better be careful what I say here, but you know, how they manipulate people into buying stuff. Um, where, the, where the product sits on the shelf, there's probably supermarket people here. Um, but it, it's fascinating and, and a real insight into um, human psychology. Um, it's quite cool, um, but, you know, the, it, it, but it's, it's really about 
marketing and getting your brand to pop from the shelf to differentiate yourself from others. Because if you've got a whole line of um, meat in a case, it's kind of meat, isn't it? So how does that look different? And that's what you know we as Atkins Ranch, but also New Zealand, Nick, you know, we need to do better at um, differentiating ourselves on the on, in the product uh, in, the, in the shelf, make it look different. I and mean, you know, we've got the attributes, but you know, one cut of meat looks the same, are kind of the same, doesn't it? So it's trying to find that story. And then, of course, then supermarkets they don't want us our brands on the on there because then we're giving up. Um, the chance for them to tell their story. So it's, it's, it's a continuous battle. It's, it's fascinating stuff, though. Yeah, I can feel like everyone out there being like, yeah, I've been sucked in by the shiny chocolate or chippies at the end of the supermarket. Maybe they should get sucked in by shiny red meat. That'd be better, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, look, how important is diversification and adaptability? And, Mark, I know this is something you're quite passionate about. Yeah, I think... Um, uh, when, when, when my wife and I came home um, mid-2000s, um, we just carried on, did what mum and dad did for the first couple of years, and, and it was just pretty bloody clear, excuse my language, um, it wasn't going to work like the way it was. I mean, things change and all the time, and, you know, if I, just a little aside, like the, the word climate, words climate change all the time, we could just prop drop the word climate all the time, because everything's changing all the time, isn't it? The weather's always changing, the markets are always changing, you know, how we react to things is changing. Um, and so we, we sort of, we had the, the land resource to be able to, um, we, had, we had some irrigation to do some arable stuff and you can basically stack that on top of the existing business without impacting things too much. Um, then my wife saw an opportunity in tourism, Martinborough is a pretty popular little wine village so um, we stacked some tourism on there and recently we've stacked some stargazing on top of there too and trying to monetize that so, um, you know, we're, we're wondering what's next to be fair. Yes, well, we were supposed to be visiting your farm with a certain tiny pub attached behind a vehicle, so that I'm could have... on a have... farm, eh? Perfect. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, James, obviously Southland have had to change and adapt a lot, especially in recent years. What about uh, diversification and adaptability in terms of your operation? Yeah, so uh, when I started farming, we were 100% sheep. Um, you're probably not going to want to hear this now, but we're down to 50% sheep and we've got a dairy farm. We do a significant amount of dairy support, which has allowed us to come through these financial times in better shape. Um, you know, I'm still a massive sheep um, uh, advocate and I still believe strongly in the future, but it has balanced our risk profile on our property. But it's introduced new new risks and challenges. So. You know, everyone knows Southland's you know, a challenging place to winter stock. Um, you know, when you've got a significant cattle component, we've had to come up with systems that have allowed us to do that in a sustainable way, which we believe, actually we, we went to a, a fellow catchment group and, and come up with a new, completely new grazing system that um, effectively block grazing cattle on the only stand a piece of ground for 24 hours before they move on. Um, so those solutions to all problems. It's just a matter of, you know, thinking whether it's technology or, you know, going going to another group and learning a different way of doing something. There's generally a way you can work through that. Joe and Alan, what about um, adaptability and diversification of your operation? Uh, yep. So um, I always have this little mantra: management is the science of change. So y you know when. Um, when a manager or one of our staff member comes to us and they're going, oh, you know something, well, you know, get on with it. It's, everything's changing. So you, you, we've, we've grown our sheep and beef business. We've, we've got on the dairy bandwagon too, we, you know, diversified our income. On the sheep and beef side, we used to have beef cows and, um, but we've got steep hill country so uh, they were hard on the hill country they you know they had a purpose but now with good water systems and subdivision we can um we don't really need that beef cow anymore so we've got actually haven't had any beef cows for about five years and we've just got trading um cattle and and a, and a breeding ewe flock so yeah it's a, it's about it's about adapting over time and um that's sort of where i sit joe sounds good <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know if you caught that. Joe just said that sounds good. Um, if Michelle's around, if she could come and whisper in my ear how long we've got, my watch is actually just there for decoration. Um, so I'm just going to look at what the future of farming looks like in New Zealand. And Joe, I know you're really involved in growing future farmers, as Ellen alluded to. You've got two staying with you. Oh, yeah, thanks, Ro. Um, well, just first start, we're pretty excited about the future of farming in New Zealand. Um, we believe that you know the success of the food and fibre sector is essential to the success of a bright and prosperous New Zealand. So, so excited to hear the government um, talking today about wanting to double the value of ag exports um, over the next 10 years. That's music to our ears and um, obviously we're on the ground. Uh, that's, we'll, we'll get ourselves into gear and make sure that happens. Um, and good to hear that they're out there hustling on our behalf overseas. And also really um, appreciate seeing government and our farming communities, um, you know, they've been everywhere telling us they are backing us and that's really important for us to be positive. Um, so I'm a big believer to ensure we continue to be the best farmers in the world. We need to train and support a new generation of farmers who are forward thinking, future focused, adaptable, innovative, community minded and resilient. So Alan and I are very passionate about being farm trainers on the Growing Future Farmers program um, that is helping to build amazing work ready young people who are motivated and enthusiastic about joining us in our sector. They're just so energising um, and it's really, you know, we feel like we're producing not only um, bloody good farmers of the future but actually bloody good humans. Um, it's hugely rewarding uh, and energising to see these young students graduate our program with a set of skills that is valued by farmers. So for those of you who don't know anything about growing future farmers, it's a, um, it's a career pathway for mainly um, kids from school to, who want to go down more the vocational, um, practical um, side of things in farming. And at, moment, at the moment, we're actually only involved in the sheep and beef sector, but we're looking to expand pan sector into um, dairy and hort. So uh, they spend two years on farm. Um, we have a first and second year, so um, they live, they live on, in a farm cottage on the farm. Um, they come into our business and ask a lot of questions, and, um, and we, we have to have have to have a really good look at ourselves and say why are we doing this you know um, what can we teach these young people and maybe we could change because what they're suggesting is we've just been doing it for a long time but maybe there's a different way of doing it so uh, they get trained off farm by industry specialists um, and then and then on they come back on farm and they and they put the hours um, learning what they've learned from the industry specialists so um, we've been very lucky to have such good backing from many of you here um, and I just really want in particular to um, say a big thank you to Tony, the wonderful Tony Egan who's um, Greenleaf Foundation. He, um, he got involved with us right from the start and thank you Tony. It's um, people like you, it helps other people get on board and, um, and obviously Agmart, uh, the Donny Trust and um, Rabu Bank are our, our main sponsors. So, um, yep, no, thank you for that. Uh, we also have um, obviously a strong relationship with Sawfern Farms, and we um, have, as Dale mentioned, went on our um, uh, on a tour with them. And um, I think for us, it was so exciting to meet our consumers, um, and we couldn't believe how excited they were to meet us and uh, hear about what we do on farm so that they could, they could share that story. Um, I think as New Zealand farmers, we have a great story to tell. We're obviously 100% grass-fed animals, 360 days of the year, um, in a pure, natural and an open environment. And um, the best part is, as Kiwi farmers, it's just part of what we do every day. And, um, and I guess it's part of our DNA and we love what we're doing, so we feel lucky. Fantastic. Um, and just a quick final question um, from both Jace. I think I've been still calling you Jace. <laughs> or I, I think I sat on my pen, so I haven't been able to uh, correct my notes. Uh, Jace, you and your family have just won the Southland Balanced Farm Environment Awards. I saw you in Hamilton a couple of weeks ago for the Sustainability Showcase. What does the future of farming look like for you and, and where might the, the biggest opportunity be moving forward? Um. 
Yeah, well, obviously, I, I, I think there's a strong future. My, my son's come into the business, so we wouldn't have encouraged that if we didn't think there was. But I think, well, I think the challenge has to go back to everyone in this room about you know, what we can do to create more value. Because if we don't get more value back at farm level, um, there's simply not enough in a sheep and beef situation to split that up for ownership. There's definitely pathways for different vocations through the industry that are really exciting, don't get me wrong. But if we fundamentally want young people to become owners and participate in this, this business, we need more profitability back at farm. And I, you know, I think of, there's potential uh, collaboration within the processing industry. I think um, you know, we, we're talking about India, massive opportunity. I wonder if you know, our lens of thinking that has to be you know, a full FDA, should we not look at it more pragmatically and say, let's do what we can now, get that value, um, rather than just say it's all or nothing. That just seems to me like, you know, it's actually really here and now. We have to create more value or we're not going to have young people coming in and then we don't have an industry. So I think the challenge is on all of us. We've got to do what we can, wherever we can, to create more value. Fantastic. And a final comment from you, Mark. Yeah, I'm pretty excited, really. Like, I think it's, um, there's quite a lot of navel-gazing going on at the moment in, in, in sheep farming. And, um, you know, that, that means those who aren't navel-gazing, there's opportunities. So you just got to keep your eyes open. Um, and it's actually quite encouraging coming to a room like this and having all these smart people telling us about what they're up to and all these cool ideas. And um, it's a real cool ecosystem behind it. It gives me quite a lot of confidence that, you know, all you smart people out there kind of working more or less on our behalf. Yeah, you're trying to make a buck like we all are. But to get our product through the production lines, through offshore, um, in the best state possible. It's pretty cool. And so I uh, thanks, you know, on, on, on my behalf, but I guess on other farmers' behalf for most for the work you guys do out there, it's pretty cool. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got Jason Miller, Mark Guscott, and Alan and Joe Johnston. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. Oh, it's nice.